You go into the Navy in November 1963. The ship that you are on, the USS Hansen, a destroyer, first is off the coast of Vietnam in uh, mid-65, which still, that's, that's pretty early in the, in the Vietnam War. Where in that process did Vietnam kind of come into your mind along with the realization that maybe you would be involved somehow? Um, I, you know, shortly after boot camp, I went to uh, fire control A school at Great Lakes as well. While the war didn't really catch up with me, you, you saw a lot of activists activities going on around you. Outside the base? Yeah. Outside the base, you know, you go into Chicago and, um, I, you know, I never was treated as, as I can recall poorly in Chicago because you had to go in in your Navy uniform or anywhere I went, we were always able to have a good time and meet girls and, and do whatever we had to do. But, you know, the, the, the war itself kind of didn't catch on, you know, you're trying to figure out what what your guns are for when you're going through this A school, what kind of ship am I going to be on and what am I going to be shooting? So th that's what, that's what kind of started creeping in my mind. You said you saw um, anti-war activity in Chicago already in 1964? I, you know, it was, I, it, it was just a kind of a, you know, you'd listen to the news and you would see protesters around. Oh. I've never interfaced with any protester. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I recall uh, once I was in Vietnam, um, I wrote a letter to the local newspaper about all of the protesting that was going on and something to the effect that, uh, you know, we're over here trying to protect the country and protect the democracy. And, uh, you know, the people back home are just, you know, uh, raising all kinds of cane about it. When you leave San Diego and you're headed across the Pacific, then in, in mid-65, you're making stops along the way. Um, did you know that you were going to duty duty station off of Vietnam, or did you think you were just going on a traditional Westpac? Well, you know, I not knowing what a traditional Westpac was, there was a lot of talk about going to Vietnam. But you know, the the war was, you know, the the missions at that time in '65 were scarce. Right. You know, so. Uh, our engagement, uh, just from a shore battery standpoint, were not, you know, they were few and far between, you know, and, and it didn't really catch up to me. I think I mentioned that uh, we did have a junk uh, approach the ship and guys on the junk had rifles. And they started shooting at us. Nobody on the ship was hit, but it didn't take long for us to, you know, to pull away from them and, and then to blow them out of the water. And that was the first, the first time that we really experienced anything like that. The shore bombardments, we, uh, you know, there were some shore batteries that were firing against us, but from what we could tell, we were out of range of their batteries. Part of the missions that uh, we were tasked with being a destroyer uh, was to follow the aircraft carriers. And anytime they had a launch, um, you know, of their, uh, their bombs, you know, they would go into a launch position, would follow them. And then when the when the planes came home, we would have to be there for search and rescue if any of the planes went down. And, you know, 
probably the first time we went into that um, battle mode, if you would, because it was general quarters, um, you know, it, it dawned on me that some of these pilots might not come back mm. uh, because they're going over there on bombing missions and they might not come back. And then, then what really set in is uh, the very first time that we were firing, uh, firing our guns at shore batteries, um, you're thinking, well, we're out five miles, five miles from the shoreline. You can't really see anything, but the spotters tell you what you've hit. And you know, you know what your 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 firing mission was, and uh, you know you, you hit your target, or you know you you know they tell you up, you know up two percent or whatever it is to uh, get right on target. So that's when that's when I realized that there were people over there that our guns were killing. Um, and, you know, while I felt bad about it, uh, not much I could do, but follow orders and, and, uh, shoot the guns from my GQ station. We couldn't tell whether they were Marines or army. It, you know, they were, they were our, our, uh, personnel on the ground looking for some kind of support. And uh, sometimes they had plane spotters right. and uh, sometimes they had ground spotters. Most of the time it was ground spotters, but occasionally we would uh, see a, a, you know, a plane spotter would come in. And one of the uh, spotters said that uh, our ship uh, was right on target every time. So uh, which was a compliment to the uh, to the gun crews and and so forth, but that's when that's when I realized that this is not going to be fun. As part of your job, were you actually able to hear the um, the forces on the ground who are calling into the ship? Did you actually hear them, or did you just get the order from? an officer who's listening to what the ground troops are saying. Um, I, I could hear them. You know, I had a couple of different GQ stations. One of them um, was the uh, computer operator. Uh, you know, these, these computers were analog computers, uh, a big gray box with dials and cranks and things on it, you know, that, that you had manual inputs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you had to put the the manual input. So when you know they had the uh, the the spotter came directly into the microphone down into the computer room, and you could hear him say, you know, up to or or right one and stuff like that. So you know we'd have to manually adjust the computer and and acknowledge that we were ready to fire again. You're getting these messages, you know, the ground troops need support. You send the, the um, shells out. Um, and you'll, sometimes you'll get feedback, you know, you, you know, right on target, you know. And so you get that. Um, but then the firing stops. And I always wonder about, you know, sort of, um, the psychological transition, or I'm just interested in, in the psychological effect of that, because it's almost, it's maybe a little bit like, you know, the, the B-52 bombers, where they are managing a, a lot of power, um, and they're, you know, they're in, they're commanding this power, and, and the, the bombs are falling, the shells are going out, it's having an impact on the people on the ground, but in their case, they're very high up. In your case, you're out to sea. And I wonder, you know, even though you're part of the war, is the war kind of always a little bit of an abstraction because it's kind of always 
out there it's five or six miles away does that make sense is it, is it, is yeah it, it does like it does yeah you know it it it, it doesn't get personal until something happens uh, to the ship. And, and we took fire a couple of different times. And uh, one, one we were fired upon by a shore battery and they were pretty darn close. Hmm. And the shells were uh, hitting uh, in the air, shrapnel was bouncing off of the the director, of which my general quarter station was half and half. But I was sitting in the director, and all of a sudden I hear this boom, and uh, you know the the bunch of rattling on the outside, and I said that was close. Yeah. <laughs> that was really now, this close. Is, a, is this is this are these shells coming from North Vietnam? Were you off the coast of North Vietnam at that time? I can't remember which coast. I believe it was North Vietnam because they had the heavier, they had the heavier batteries up there. But, sure. you know, I, you know, it was then I realized that that thing was close. Wow. And fortunately, or hopefully nobody was hit by the shrapnel. And what was the response? Did your ship return fire? Did aircraft go in and bomb that site do you remember oh, what we kept we like? kept we kept returning fire i i believe they were uh they had a spotter near there so we were firing on that spot and then it stopped oh. so whether we hit them or they just said well all right we got a close one there we'll we'll stop firing uh -huh. did you ever set foot in Vietnam itself? Did your ship ever, um, you know, tie up? Um, I think you mentioned that you tied up once in the Saigon River or, or at least once in the Saigon River. Did, did, your, did you ever, um, you know, set foot actually on the soil of South Vietnam? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they let us, they let us off for, to go to the, uh, uh, to do a little bit of liberty. In Saigon? In Saigon, yeah. And then, once we were there, that's when we were exposed to Agent Orange. You know, um, yeah, it had this terrible smell in the air all the time we were on shore. And uh, I, I didn't, I had no idea what it was. And, you know, I didn't feel unsafe or anything like that when we were at shore. But, uh, you know, when when we were pulling back out at sea again, you you knew that uh, you were at general quarters and that you had to, you know, be ready for anything. But yeah, the agent orange, the agent orange, caught up with me later on in life. Well, right. So when we think of agent orange, we think mainly of guys who are out in the boonies. But was it because they were spraying the foliage along the Saigon River? Is that that was part of it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the other, um, we were, we were exposed a couple of different times, but that was the, the main thing. And, you know, they, they call them blue water. They got, uh, initiative going on right now for, uh, blue water sailors who were exposed to Agent Orange. And our ship was one of them, uh, where if, if you had, uh, uh, severe effects from it. Myself, I had heart issues. I had prostate removed um, and a couple of other things. So a likely source then is spraying the foliage along the Saigon River. And that's, that's, a, that's a likely source. Yeah. The agent yeah. for you. Um, how much time did you spend in Saigon on Liberty? We were there, I think, four days. On Liberty itself, you only go in for the night, you know, and then you're back on the ship. But the ship was exposed mm. five days. Right. Um, what memories do you have of Saigon? Did you feel, I think a few minutes ago, you said that you felt you didn't feel like you're in danger or anything when you were in Saigon. What what memories do you have of the city in in '67? 
Um, <clears throat> not a lot, I, to be honest with you. It, it may have been that, you know, you, you, you get off the ship and you, you go to a bar and, and, <laughs> and everything you get drunk after and forgotten. you hang back to the ship. Did your ship play a role in interdiction of, you know, trying to prevent um, weapons from the north getting into the south, you know, from the sea? Did your, did your ship play any interdiction roles or the two ships you served on? Uh, yeah, we were always patrolling off the coast for things like that. Um, we, we didn't have any uh, action that was close with one ship or another uh, off the sure. coast. Yeah. You know, so we didn't engage, let's put it that way. Right. How often would you say fire missions came in? So you have these two, two tours when you're off the coast of Vietnam, 65, 67. In a seven day week, how many of those days would a fire mission come in on, on average, would you guess? Well, in 65, um, you know, probably two weeks. I, I, I saw a letter of mine that said, uh, we, we fired during the, during the tour, we fired over 200 rounds at shore batteries. On the second tour, we fired over 9,000 rounds. Mm. So the first tour, we, we didn't fire a lot of ammunition, you know, five or six, five or six times, maybe once every week or once every two weeks, we would do a shore bomb mission. But most of that time was either patrolling the coast or um, following the carrier during doing search and rescue. Whereas the second tour, 9,000. Um, that the was a lot of ammo. <laughs> yeah, yeah 9,000 shells. So is that almost every day? Yeah. It sounds like the second tour was much more intense. Second tour was much more intense. And, uh, you know, as a result, we got to see, it was a lot longer, I think, the tour was longer. And and uh, the ports of call that we, we got to visit for R&R &R were something that we never thought of visiting. And the first trip, it was just the Philippines and and Yokosuka, Japan, and then Hawaii. And that was probably it. Stop at, at Guam to refuel and, and head on. But uh, the second trip uh, where, where we, we had some very nice ports of call in, in Hong Kong and, and uh, Taiwan. Uh, had Walin was another one in Formosa. While in was a, you know, we were the first Navy ship to pull in there since World War II. Wow. And, you know, those people were very, very gracious. Well, this us. is going to ask you, how, how were you treated as an American in these different ports you went to? You mentioned Hong Kong, Taiwan, of course, Subic Bay, there's a large Navy base there. So they're used to seeing American sailors. But these other ports you go to, how... How did you feel you were received by the locals? Uh, Hong Kong was interesting because one of the duties I had pulled was shore patrol with the Aussies. <laughs> so they had permanent shore patrol there. So there was still you know, a British got, colony at that time. Yeah, basically. yeah I, got, I got sent to uh, do a shore patrol with them for three days. And uh, that, that was an interesting three days because they knew every bar, they knew every part of town that, you know, and, and they threw me the keys to the paddy wagon that we were driving and said, here, you're driving. And I said, I've never driven one of these things, especially in this country. On the you opposite know, where, side of the road, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, uh, you know, it, you know I, got to, I got to meet some uh, just great, sale, great, uh, uh, personnel there in, uh, in Hong Kong. 
you know, I found that the uh, the the people obviously in in Hong Kong uh, and the bars and the shops and the restaurants and places like that where we went were very gracious. Uh, the same as Taiwan and uh, the same as Formosa, Japan as well. And let me uh, call to your mind uh, something that a lot of um, sailors and Marines who serve in the Pacific, uh, something they know well. Uh, you're there at Subic Bay and then you cross a little bridge over a famous river and now you're in the city of Alangapo uh, in, the, in the Philippines. And um, it's one of the most remarkable transitions, I think, <laughs> in the world from the, the order and security of the US Navy base across a short bridge into the, the utter chaos of, of Alangapo. Um, but what memories, assuming you went into Alangapo? Oh yeah, I uh, loved I loved Alangapo. I, I, was, but, I was one of those sailors that, uh, used to live for the bars and, and uh, you know, go there for the music and, and dance with the girls and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, I, you know, I had a good time in Alangapo and, and uh, um, you know, places like that, it's, it's, it's hard to feel downtrodden by the, by the locals. You know, mm -hmm. I may have put myself in position where people have taken money from me, but you know, it, probably was because I was not sober enough to realize what was going on. You mentioned the um, also following the carriers in case a, 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 maybe a disabled plane doesn't make it in the water, doesn't make it to the ship and goes into the water, something like that. Um, on In either tour, did you have anything like that where your ships were involved in picking up a downed pilot? Yeah, we recovered several pilots, you know, from uh, from the sea, uh, either either their ship or their plane uh, uh, did didn't make it to the carrier and they had to bail out um, or they crashed as they were coming into the deck and they bailed out before they crashed. But, you know, we picked them. We typically picked them up um, and bought them ashore.